Now there's one other ripple we can throw into this model of the expensive tissue hypothesis, and this comes from genetics. A number of years ago, researchers studying the genomes of humans and the great apes discovered a difference in one specific gene, a gene referred to as myosin. Now myosin is a gene that actually has functions related to muscular development, and the particular myosin gene they identified as being different between humans and the great apes is one that's highly expressed in the musculature of the jaw. In other words, it's highly expressed with the muscles associated with chewing, specifically the temporalis muscle and the masseter muscle. Now recall that apes have very large temporalis muscles that occupy big portions of the brain. On that gorilla skull we saw earlier in the semester, those muscles are so large that they help form a sagittal crest on the top of the skull. Now the difference that exists between humans and the great apes in this particular gene has to do actually with a mutation that propagated at some point in our evolutionary past and has made this gene non-functioning in humans. So while this gene is critical for the proper muscular development in the great apes, it doesn't work in humans. Now one idea is that for this mutation to have existed and persisted in humans, in other words, for this muscle basically to have had some kind of uh, degradation in its development over time, humans must have had an alternative form of processing food. In other words, they wouldn't have needed that muscle. The retention of that gene in other primates suggests it's essential, but in humans it's no longer essential. Now it turns out we can get a date on when we think that mutation propagated throughout humans. And it turns out that date, at least the point estimate of it, is somewhere around two and a half million years. Now depending on the model we use, that might be more like a million and a half years, or it might be three and a half million years. But it happens to be that it corresponds to roughly the same time we see the earliest evidence of stone tools. And you could make the argument that that gene, the knockout, which caused basically a non-functioning muscular development gene associated with the jaws, of the, uh, jaws and teeth of humans, couldn't have persisted, couldn't have propagated in humans if we didn't have an alternative way of processing food. Stone tools are that obvious alternative. That in order for the myosin mutation that exists in humans, that knockout gene to, that exists in humans to persist, we needed to have stone tools already present when it appeared. As it happens again, the timing in the fossil record fits this overall picture, and that the myosin gene couldn't have persisted without stone tools already being present. Now the authors of this study also make a secondary argument that reduction in this muscle may have been essential for allowing for larger brain growth. That essentially that muscle, being that it housed right on top of the skull, acts as a constraint on brain development. This is more hypothetical and needs further testing, but nevertheless the story of the myosin mutation, this change that may have allowed for additional brain growth, but almost certainly corresponds with this ecological transition that we see in early Homo, is an important part of the early evolutionary story in the genus Homo, and reflects that the changes we see in early Homo aren't just anatomical, they also involve underlying genetic changes as well.